Like I said, I'm continuing today on the living in the overflow. And today I want to talk about a land that overflows. Your land that God has given you that overflows. So we let's recap. I said that it's God's will for you and for me to live in the overflow of his goodness and blessings. Overflow means being saturated in the blessing. It's been overwhelmed by the goodness of God. How many of you know God is good? Say God is good. I'm telling you God is absolute good. Absolute good. Um, let me just take my phone here because I put it in my notes. But I want to, I wanna, do you know what, what the amount is for, for absolute cold? Let me tell you what's the amount for absolute cold. I made a note of it here, so let me give you the correct figure. Absolute cold. Celsius, that's where we deal with that. Fahrenheit is different, but minus 273.15 is absolute cold. If you go minus 100 there, there's still heat around you, even though you might be freezing. Only minus 273.15 is absolute cold. Well, I want to say to you this morning, God is absolute good. There is no trace of bad in him. Every good gift, every perfect gift comes from above, from our Father and comes down to you. There is nothing bad in God. He is a good God. And you have to get a revelation of that because we love, life is not always good, but God is always good. Amen. God's greatest desire is to see us as his children live in the overflow, a land overflowing with the goodness of God. And anyone can have this. I'm telling you, you can start at minus, you can start at zero, but if you take God at his word, you can rise to the top. Doesn't matter where you live, does it, the blessing works independently of the world system. It's not, oh, if I only live there, if I only had that connection, if I only had that opportunity, then I would prosper. Not the blessing. The blessing works independently of where you live. It will work in, in fact, it works in the most uncomfortable situations. That's when the blessing really comes to pass in a big way. So I'm saying to you this morning, let's not blame our environment, our past, our parents, our culture. No, no, take God at his word and you will come to the top. We, we were there. We had nothing. They took, the, we never had a car. They auctioned our home. We, our electricity was off. We had to live with family and friends and people. We had no jobs. We had nothing. We were absolute zero. In fact, we weren't just at the bottom of the bucket. We were under the bucket and the bucket was on top of us. But God, who is rich in mercy, I stood on the word of God and it began to bring us up and out. The word. So stop looking to other people. Look to the word. The word will bring you out. Amen. Last week we spoke that the blessing is more than enough. We spoke about the fact that you've been redeemed, you've been delivered from the curse of never enough. It is a curse to not have enough. It is a curse to, to, to have never enough. It's a curse. And you've been redeemed from that curse to the blessing of Abraham. You've been, uh, you've been redeemed to the blessing of more than enough. So it might not be like that right now in your situation, but you have to believe that word and, and let it alter your mind until your mind and your spirit agree with that word. Because your spirit believes it. It's your mind that challenges it. Or maybe tradition or religious tradition that says no for them, but not for you. You have to stay in the word until it, you have a mind alteration. Where your mind is renewed with the word of God. Where you start seeing yourself with it before others see you with it. So look at God's will. Psalm 35, 27. Let them shout for joy and be glad who favor my righteous cause. And let them say continually, let the Lord be magnified who has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. That's what you must say all the time. You mustn't say, oh, no, it's bad. On Amal circle, I never have enough. No, that's not what you should be saying. You must say continually, let the Lord be magnified, for he has pleasure in my prosperity. He has pleasure in my well-being. 
3 John 1, 2 says, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health, even as your soul prospers. So spirit, soul, and body, three part being in there. God wants you to have total prosperity. Do you know that money is the lowest form of power? Money is not the greatest form of power. Money is the lowest form of power. You know what's the greatest? Prayer. Prayer is the greatest form of power. You can have no money, but if you pray, you can have a lot of money and not know how to pray and you don't know how to come out of your situation. You need people around you that know how to pray. I thank God for our intercessors, Joan, Antipopi, Rueda. They pray for us. I mean, I know there are many others, but they just pray. Come stand, Joan. Stand, Rueda. Stand, Antipopi. I want to honor these three people. Oh, we appreciate you. Because without your prayers, I wouldn't be standing like I am today. And having what we have. Thank you. Thank you for always praying. And I know there's many others of you also who pray. But, but I'm just talking about their specific call is to pray and intercede for us as pastors and for our church and for you. When we tell them so and so, they pray for you. Amen. So that's how we, we have pleasure. God has pleasure in your prosperity, child of God. You need to say continually. I remember years ago when I was also in that down situation and I didn't know what's happening. And I said, where's God in this thing, man? And the minute I said it, I knew my spirit was so grieved because I was, my, I was going through such a challenging time that I spoke against God. And whatever you speak against, you will never possess. Speak against your pastor every time. You will never possess his anointing and his deliverance that God's placed on his life for you. Don't speak. You speak ill of the country. You're not going to enjoy this country. You pray for our president. You pray for those in authority. You pray for the situation. And God will turn it around. But I'm saying we must be careful what we say. Amen. Say continually, let the Lord be magnified. For he has pleasure in your prosperity. So let's look at Deuteronomy 28.11. This is part of the blessing of Abraham. If you read from verse 1 to 14 in De Deuteronomy 28, you read on the blessings of Abraham. If you read from verse 15 to 68, you read the curses. Now I encourage you to read the curses. You know why? So you can see what you redeem from. And I'm not accepting the sickness in my body. Because Christ redeemed me from this. Or oh, I'm not accepting this poverty and lack. Because Christ redeemed me from it. Or oh, I'm not accepting living under a rule of oppression. Because God redeemed me from it. So go read the curses so you can see what God's delivered you from. Amen. But in verse 11 it says, And the Lord will grant you plenty of goods. The Lord will grant you, not me. I never said that. The Bible said that. The Bible said the Lord will grant you Plenty of goods. I mean, plenty is God's will for your life. It's not God's will for you to not have enough. Plenty. The word plenty means a more than adequate supply. In the King James, it uses the word plenty as it means abundance. It means more than enough. It means excess. It means much left over. And goods there means prosperity, wealth, good things, the best things. So the Lord will grant you, listen... An abundance, more than enough, excess, much left over, a more than adequate supply of prosperity, wealth, good things, the best things. That's God's will for you. Say, Lord, I believe that. Lord, I receive that. Lord, I take that. Amen. You have to believe it in your heart and declare it and say, Lord, it's your will for me to have plenty of goods, plenty of wealth, plenty of the best things, the good things. I mean, if you are a parent, you want your children to have the best things. You get hurt in your heart when you can't provide for your children or there's no nappies or there's no school clothes or there's no food or you can't pay your bills. That's not prosperity. That is not good. That is bad. Anything that is bad is under the curse. Get it right in your mind and stop accepting things that you should not accept. So you might be sitting like with challenging things you're dealing with right now, but believe it in your heart that it's God's will for you to come up and come out. Amen. The Lord will grant you plenty of, of abundance. Amen. So do, in the message of that verse, he says, God will lavish you with good things. Lavish you. My mother used to say when we got paid at the end of the month 
and then we bought now takeaways, you know. And then she, and, and, um, then she'll say, oh, I see you living lavishly, my son. Amen. <laughs> lavishly. Now, the word lavish means to expend or giving great amounts or without limit. God will expend or spend on you. You know, God will spend on you. God is not cheap. God will spend big bucks on you. He'll spend great things on you. I even know of certain people when you get around them, oh, they just quick to pay and quick to just spend and give you the best and buy the best. Not just cheap and oh, shame. Yeah, here's a pastor coming. Let's hide the Jacob's coffee. Let's give him re coffee. Huh? I'm not visiting you at that house. You take out the best crockery, the cutlery. You give out the best. Because you serve a God that gives you the best things. Amen. Amen. <laughs> so God will lavish you with good things. Amen. So that's God's will and desire. He wants to expend, giving great amounts and without limit good things to you. Say, Lord, I believe that. So, Lord, I receive that. In 1 John 3, 1 NIV, it says, how great is the love the Father has lavished on us. That we should be called children of God. Oh, your heavenly Father has lavished his love on you. He's lavished his love on you. You are called a child of God. God gives you his love in great amounts and without limit. You are never out of reach of God's love. You, you can never do anything that will make God love you less. And you can't do anything extra to make him love you more. He loves you with a perfect love through Jesus and what he's done on the cross. But the Father, how great. You, you must understand the Old Testament people never had this picture of the Father. They saw him as somebody who just wants to, to hurt them. But it was God trying to protect them. They couldn't come near him because of the blood and because of sin. But once Jesus went to the cross and paid the price for our sin and gave his blood, now we can come boldly to the throne of grace. The prophets of old wanted and desired this time we're living in. They, they saw it coming where they can have access into the most holy place and receive the love the Father has for you. So it's one thing to believe the Father loves you. It's another thing to receive it. I can give you a gift. I can give you and invite you. Every Sunday, we invite people to church. It's those who respond and receive will come and eat from the banquet of God's table of abundance. So there's constant invitation, but it's when you receive the love. It's when you receive the love God the Father has for you. That's when you begin to see an effect. Can I show you an example? John the disciple received Jesus' love. Judas didn't. Because he never received Jesus' love. Even at the end when he missed it and messed up, he still had an opportunity to repent right there at the table. But you know what? He, he partook of communion, intimacy with him, and still betrayed him. And after he took communion and never received his love, that's when the devil entered him. Go read it. The devil entered him after that. And you're either receiving the love or you're receiving darkness. No other way. So I want to encourage you this morning. Maybe you grew up in a home or an environment where you were not shown much love. But get to know who your heavenly father is. And sit on your daddy's lap and let him tell you how much he loves you. And then begin to receive his love and embrace it. Even when you cannot feel it, receive it. Even when you cannot understand it. Don't, don't evaluate your heavenly father's love for you by what you go through. You don't have any money in the bank account. Now you say God doesn't love you. Or you may be needing your body to be healed. Now you say God doesn't love you. You ask in your body if God loves you. You ask in your bank account if God loves you. No, you ask in your circumstances if God loves you. Does God love you? No, no. You ask the word. Every morning when I get up, it says he still loves me just as much as he loves Jesus. It says he still lavished his love on me. You read the word. That's where it comes from. Amen. That's how much your father loves you. In the, Deut let's go back to Deuteronomy 28, 11 in the Bible basic edition. Um, it says the Lord will make you fertile in every good thing. Amen. Any fertile ladies, men, you need to be made fertile. <laughs> Amen. 
The Lord will make you fertile. That word fertile means producing a large amount of something. A large amount. So the Lord, the blessing, or the Lord, or the blessing that makes rich and adds no sorrow, will produce a large amount of good things in your life. Amen? It's the blessing that produces it, not you. All you have to do is be obedient to whatever God asks you to do. If he says, go there, go there. If he says, stay here, stay here. If he says, do that, do that. If he says, pray there, fast there, give that, so that just be obedient to whatever instructions he asks you to do. If he says, forgive somebody today, then forgive them. When I forgive someone, doesn't mean they were right in what they did to me. It means I go free. That's what forgiveness means. Forgiveness is not between you and the other person. It's actually between you and God. Amen? Just like bread is necessary for the body, forgiveness is necessary for your soul. Amen? C.S. Lewis said that. So the Lord, the blessing is producing. Say that the Lord and the blessing is producing a large amount of good things in my life. So when you have more than enough, then you can sow towards a Christmas outreach. But when you don't have, then, and, and it's amazing, the ones who criticize our prosperity is the same ones that's going to ask for a bucket at the end of this year. I've seen it over the 10 years. Don't criticize when you condemn another man's blessings. How can you expect to have your own? Never condemn other people's blessings. When you see them drive that, have that, earn that salary, say, Lord, I'm so happy because I'm in the blessing line and I'm next. Say that I'm in the blessing line. And I'm next. And say that that happens to me all the time. So when somebody gives a good testimony of what they received and all that. I mean, I'm wearing a brand new tacky today. Amen. God is good. Flosham, guys. Flosham. Now, I'm not yet to brag. I mean, really, it doesn't bother me at all. I'm telling you. I, it used to bother me. Not at all. But this came because of... Birthday gifts that came. And so I took the money and I went to go and buy this week. Sometimes I don't like to spoil myself. Man, that's also part of poverty thinking. You can spoil everyone else, but you can't receive yourself. That's not good. There's a problem there. I can give, I can give my last to everyone. But then my wife will say, give me that money. I'll go buy you the thing you need. Because she knows. I, don't, I always think of others first. And it's good. But the Bible says, do not only think of your own interests, but also of the interests of others. It doesn't say you mustn't think of your own interests. First, make sure your rent is paid, then you can go pay other people's rent. Amen? That's wisdom. So look at Genesis 26, 12 to 13 NIV. This is what we spoke of last week with uh, Isaac. It says, Isaac planted crops in that land where it was a famine, and the same year reaped a hundredfold because the Lord blessed him. You see, he was obedient and he sowed. The man became rich and his wealth continued to grow until he became very wealthy. Increase. The blessing produced a large amount of good things in his life. That was part of the blessing. Look at the expanded Bible version of that verse. It says the Lord will make you rich. The word rich there doesn't mean like our God's going to give you a million rand. It means an abundant supply. It means the Lord, the Lord will make you rich. Now, let me confirm with you a scripture that shows you you've already been made rich. 2 Corinthians 8, 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you, that you through his poverty might become rich. So that's in the Bible. I never said that. God said that. He became poor. Say that I'm poor no more. He became poor. He became like a beggar, that word means. He became like on the bottom rung of poverty so that you could become rich. That is redemptive language. Can I give you two other scriptures that confirms redemptive, redemptive talking like that? Isaiah 53 verse 4 and 5. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities and the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. So he took my 
sickness and disease and yours, and in exchange, ye by his stripes you healed. That's the same kind of language here. So let's go to um, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21. For he who knew no sin became sin for you, so that you through, through him might become the righteousness of God in him. So he took your sin and in exchange made you righteous. That's redemptive language. Same verse here, same thing. 2 Corinthians 8, 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, for your sake he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. So rich is not a dirty word, amen? Say rich is not a dirty word. Rich is a Bible word. Amen? And that is what I'm saying to you this morning. Rich doesn't come from the outside. It doesn't come with you having a lot of good things first. Your rich starts from the inside. There are a lot of poor people with money. Rich is on the inside. You need to get a revelation on the inside that I'm poor no more. Because you can get a lot of money, but if you don't have a revelation that you're rich and prosperous on the inside, that money will go through your hands like water. It takes, so God is saying he deals with you on the inside. You've already become rich. Oh, no, those people are rich. No, you are, you're looking on the outside to see if you're rich. No, look on the inside. If the Bible says you're rich, you're rich. If the Bible says you healed, you healed. If the Bible says you're righteous, you're righteous. Amen. You don't wait to feel righteous. You don't wait to feel healed. You, the word says you healed, you healed. The word says you're righteous, you're righteous. And if it says you're rich, you're rich now. Amen. Whew. Are you with me? So it starts, that's where it starts. It's, that's talking about soul prosperity, getting out on the inside. So in verse 11 of Deuteronomy 28, 11, the commentary on that verse in, on the Old Testament in 10 volumes, volume 1, the Pentateuch, it says, this is what it means. Super abundance will the Lord give thee for good, for happiness and prosperity. Super abundance will the Lord give thee for good. Why is he giving it to you? For good, for happiness, for prosperity. So when you have super abundance and you have more than enough and you can pay your bills and things and needs are met, then it makes you happy. It, it, it's, it's for good. It's not for bad, it's for good. Now I told you last week, the Bible says in Proverbs 132 that prosperity will destroy a fool. So what happens? People avoid being prosperous. No, just avoid being a fool. Learn what to do. Learn what a fool does and then don't do it then that's how you can keep your prosperity. God, wa God wants your money, your power, your position to be on the same level like your character. So God doesn't mind you having money, but he doesn't want money having you. He doesn't mind you having things, but he wants your character to be on the same level of your things. So you can, you can serve God with your money, but you can't serve God and money. Money mustn't be your God on a Sunday. You set aside business and money and you serve and worship him only. And while you're doing that, the blessing is taking care of your business. And I'll show you a scripture now to confirm that. So superabundance means exceedingly or excessively abundant more than sufficient. Ephesians 3.20 Amplified Classic. Now to him who by in consequence of the action of his power that is at work within us is able to carry out his purpose and do super abundantly far over and above all that we dare ask or think infinitely beyond our highest prayers, desires, thoughts, hopes or dreams. He'll do super abundantly according to the power that's working in you. That's how he's able to do it. He's got all the power. He's waiting for you to activate that power that's within you through the word. So for example, you can have, I can have this glass of water and this is my capacity to receive. But I might have a two liter water here, but the, the entire two liter bottle is mine. But I can only receive this amount of capacity, which is about 300 mils. That's how much you can only receive. It's not that it doesn't belong to you and God hasn't given it to you. God's given you everything, but it's your capacity to receive and to hold. It's not that God, God wants to give you, it's all yours. You can take it, but you can't hold it. So what must you do? You must enlarge your capacity to believe. You must enlarge your capacity to receive. You must enlarge your capacity to give. You shouldn't be giving on the same level you gave 20 years ago. 
Imagine now you're earning maybe a hundred thousand a month and you come home with some cheap roses for your wife that cost maybe, ooh, you're going to be in big trouble because really you spend so much more on something else, but you bring, no, no, no. If you love somebody, you will give them the best. Amen. I'm working on that, guys. I'm working on it. Amen. I'm listening to what my wife wants and I'm saying, Lord, she wants this. She said she wants now a 3.5 carat diamond now. It's 27 years later now. She's been waiting long for this diamond ring. So Lord, please, you must provide so I can give it to her. That's how much God loves you. He wants to give you the best. The Amplified Classic says, the Lord shall make you have a surplus of prosperity. Surplus, that's extra. That's where you put the extra in the storehouses. You know, they're in the storeroom where there's more than enough toilet rolls. There's more, there's five packets of coffee. There's, amen, more than enough. Uh, that's what uh, uh, a storehouse is for. It's for the extra. Amen. Oh, some of you, I know some of you are just even trying to just get one packet of coffee. I understand that. But don't, don't stay there. I'm giving, the word will bring you up and out there and into something. And then when your family come and say, oh, I'm sickle, I want to me tear, but he me. And then you say, come, my baby, come, come, let me help you. Here's a packet. And you go to your storeroom and you can give them because you have extra. That's the purpose. Not so you can boast and say, oh, look at all my things. No, it's to be a blessing. Amen. Surplus, an amount that is more than what is needed. Excess, extra, leftover, overflow. Say amen, pastor. That's God's will for me. I believe I receive that. So the blessing of Abraham includes a surplus of prosperity. The Lord will make you have more than what is needed. Excess, extra, leftover, overflow. So where does a surplus come from? It comes from the blessing that is working on your behalf. The blessing works, it works, and it keeps on working. Say that. Thank you, Lord. I receive extra, excess, much leftover, overflow through the blessing that is working on my behalf. It's working. It's working. Amen. On your behalf right now. So it's time for you to take your, your promised land, child of God, that overflows. God has given you a land that overflows with the goodness of God. It's a land that flows with milk and money. Uh, sorry, honey. It's a land of more than enough. It's time for you to go in and possess it. I know what I'm talking about. So before you come and criticize my prosperity, first, before you see my, you, many people see the glory, but they don't know the story. That's why you can stand confidently and say, listen, have you seen the amount we have given? If you criticize people's receiving, maybe you must check their giving. Amen. So go after the, for what God has for you, amen? Listen, for you have lived long enough at the mountain of lack, poverty, insufficiency, and shortage. You have lived long enough in the valley of indecision. You have lived long enough with those who have accepted and have an allegiance to poverty and, and to, to feeling sorry. It's time to get up. It's time to rise up. It's time to go in and possess your promised land that God's given you. You must go in and possess it. Look at Deuteronomy 1, 6 to 8 in the message. It says, back at Oreb, God, our God spoke to us. You've stayed long enough at this mountain. On your way now. Get moving. Head for the Amorite hills, wherever people are living and so forth. And then it says, look, I've given you this land. Now go in and take it. It's the land God promised to give your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and their children after them. God has given it to you, but he's waiting for you to take it. You know, most Christians, you know, the problem with some Christians is this. God brought them out of Egypt, out of a land of, of darkness and out of the world. But they're still expecting God to take them into the promised land and, and, and do the praying for them and do the fighting for them. They, they did nothing, the Israelites. They just wanted God's blessings to fall on them like ripe cherries. And it's not going to happen that way. God already did his part. He already paid the price for you. You must now get up and take what belongs to you and go in and possess your promised land. The land is yours. Go in and take it. If so-and-so don't want to go in, then you get up and go in. 
then you go in and possess it. But stop living at that. You've lived long enough at that mountain now. Always complaining, always murmuring, always blaming others. No, stop living there. Let's go in and possess all that God has for you. Let's go in and possess. We pray for you every day. We pray for you every week that you will rise up and go in and possess. That you will not sit back and just allow the enemy to, to discourage you. You have to press every Sunday to come to church. Those who press, those who the committed climbed with Jesus, those who press to hear the word of God, you have to press. Why is it pressing? Because there's pressure. There's opposition to your mission. The devil doesn't want you to come corporately in faith in the presence of God. Because one word from God can change your situation while you're in the presence. Instead of praying there all the time at home. Amen. Just be in the presence of God. All we did all the years was just go to church, me and my wife. Then we took our children, we dedicated them to the Lord. And all we did was take them to children's church. And all that we did was take them to church. And that's how we grew. Amen. That's how we grew. Just by being where we're supposed to be. So go in, child of God. Listen to these scriptures on possessing your land. Deuteronomy 28. Eight, the Lord will command the blessing on you in your storehouses. You see, there's your storehouses. Houses. And in all to which you set your hand. And he will bless you in the land which the Lord your God is giving you. Look at the next verse of your land, Deuteronomy 6.3. Therefore, yo, Israel, and be careful to observe it, that it may be well with you, and that you may multiply greatly as the Lord God of your fathers has promised you, a land flowing with milk and honey. Hallelujah. A land flowing with milk and honey. You have to believe each child of God and receive that. Deuteronomy 16 to 11. So it shall be when the Lord your God brings you, not if, when the Lord your God brings you into the land of which he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you large and beautiful cities which you did not build. Houses full of all good things which you did not fill. Hewn out wells which you did not dig. Vineyards and olive trees which you did not plant when you have eaten and are full. Your job is to believe that God can do his job. He didn't say you believe you can pay for it. He says believe you receive it when you pray. God knows how to get that houses full of all good things into our hands. He knows how to get vineyards that we never planted and wells that we never dug. He knows how to get it to you. All you have to do is believe it and receive it. And be obedient to whatever God asks you to do. Amen. That's how you possess it, child of God. We're not somewhat special here that we are where we are. No, it's just being obedient to the, you know, God doesn't give you the whole plan. He just shows you the next step. Then when you take that step, then he'll show you the next step. Then when you take that step, then he shows you the next step. But if you want all the steps before you move, you, you're not going to get it. He's showing you the first step. First, take the step he's shown you to do. And then he'll show you the next step. Amen. Obedience is where the blessing is. Obedience. Deuteronomy 8, 7 to 10. Listen what's happening to us. Amen. This is for you. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land. A land of brooks of water, of fountains and springs that flow out of valleys and hills. A land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees and pomegranates. This is not a land of nothing, man. The, a land of olive oil and honey. A land in which you will eat bread without scarcity. In which you will lack nothing. A land whose stones are iron and out of wool's ears you can dig copper. When you have eaten and are full, then you shall bless the, the Lord your God for the good land which he has given you. Amen. Say, Lord, I believe that. Lord, I receive that. That's my good land. I take it. Amen. That is God's will for us. Possessing it. The devil doesn't want you to have these things. He wants to keep the money all the time and the wealth all the time in his hands. That's why when they came out of Egypt, God said, go to everyone and demand that you take all that silver and gold and you're coming out with that. You're not coming out empty-handed. You're going to take all that 430 years of labor that you, belongs to you. You're coming out with it because it's yours. Joseph made Pharaoh rich there. 
God made that nation rich. And it was belongs to them. And God said, take all that silver and gold, bring it out and come build me a tabernacle in the wilderness. Yeah, they had to use the silver and gold and to build God a sanctuary. It's still like that today. When God, when you bring your finances into the kingdom and we're able to preach the gospel, then people become tabernacles when they get born again. They become houses of God. Instead of taking the money and they go and like air on them, they built idols in the, in the wilderness. Instead of building God's covenant, the ark where they were supposed to do that. Whenever you don't understand the purpose of something, abuse is inevitable. When you don't understand the purpose of money, then you start using it on your own lust. Instead of using it to also build the kingdom. Look, look at Leviticus 25, 18 to 22, English standard version. Therefore, you shall do my statutes and keep my rules and perform them. And then you will dwell in the land securely. The land will yield its fruit and you will eat your fill and dwell in it securely. And if you say, what shall we eat in the seventh year? If we may not, so we'll gather in our crop. So God was saying to them, don't work in the seventh year. Give the land opportunity to rest so that he can produce more for you afterwards. It's the same like today. The Lord on the seventh day, he wants us to rest. Sabbath, the blessing. And why does he want you to do that? I will command my blessing on you in the sixth year so that it will produce a crop sufficient for three years. When you sow in the eighth year, you will be eating some of the old crop. You shall eat the old until the ninth year when its crop arrives. More than enough. A land of overflow. I'm telling you while you are seeking the kingdom here, while you are busy with God's business, God is taking care of all your business and, and seeing to it. The blessing is doing that. Amen. Last scripture, Leviticus 26, 4 to 5 and verse 10, NIV. I will send you rain in its season. And the ground will yield its crops and the trees of the field their fruit. I mean, do you know with Isaac planting that seed in that ground, they discovered that it will only yield the maximum yield was between 20 to 30 fold yield and he reaped a hundred fold in that region that was barren it was a supernatural yield why because God sent his rain on that seed he sowed they, on the seed he sowed and the showers of rain came I'm telling you the Lord is going to send rain in its season he's sending physical rain for us right now and he's sending spiritual rain which represents God's favor showers of blessing is coming upon your seed coming upon your life and then when the rain comes your ground is yielding its crops and your trees of the field will yield their fruit your threshing will continue until grape harvest and the grape harvest will continue until planting and you will eat all the food you want and live in safety in your land. Hallelujah. You can have an abundance and still live in safety. You can drive the most blessed car and the most blessed home and God's angels will still encamp around you and protect you. And no weapon formed against you will prosper. Some of you don't even know. Maybe things that should have or could have happened to you. But the angel of God was right there to protect you and deliver you from it. Amen. We will only get to heaven one day and hear of stories of how angels protected us. Amen. Where God delivered us from the snare and the trap that the enemy set for us. Verse 10, you will still be eating last year's harvest when you will have to move it out to make room for the new. So get ready, get ready, get ready. Amen. Let's go in, child of God, and possess our land that overflows. It overflows with the goodness of God. God wants you to have a surplus of prosperity. He wants you to have more than enough. He wants you, he wants, he wants you to have peace in your soul when you know your needs are met. But he needs, he needs your faith. Well, you know, with Abraham, when God said, Abraham, you're going to have a child. You know what happened? He went home and, and his wife Sarah said, how is this going to happen, Abraham? Look at my age. Look at your age. There's no way. Let's try and make this happen with Hagar in the flesh. And what was born out of that fleshly situation? Ishmael. Ishmael represents the flesh. Th things of the flesh, they're easy to get hold of, but very difficult to get rid of. So wait for God's promise and wait for God's timing and wait for God's blessing on what you believe in God for.
And do you know that after Abraham disobeyed God there, God never spoke to him for 13 years. The next time God appears to him is at the age of 99. And he said, okay, Abraham, walk before me and be blameless. In other words, Abraham, I don't need your help. I don't need your help. I can take care of it myself. All I need you to do is believe me that I can do the job. And that's what God is saying. I'm telling you sometimes as a pastor, when I preach this kind of messages, you, 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 especially out there, that's why I'm very careful what I put on social media because of the criticism. And you have to preach it within your own camp and those who believe it and those who receive it. And yet, you know, we, we, we might be few in number, but I'm telling you over the 10 years of our church, we've reached more people that, that God's grace has reached. So many people have gotten saved. People have gotten filled with the Holy Spirit speaking in other tongues. How many people have gotten married? How many people's children have been dedicated? How many, I've done, not many funerals, praise God, because we live long, amen. We live strong. But I'm telling you, through the local church, God has done amazing things. Then through the outreach. What about the radio ministry that has impacted lives for so many years uh, on radio, Kofifi, 97.2, just preaching the word every week just preaching just preaching and let God leave the results up to God then the, the outreaches how many people were fed through the outreaches I mean when when was the last time you went and paid a, a 70,000 rand bill on groceries oh it's wonderful when you can go to macro and you can t- click on the card and you're paying for all that groceries so much money it's wonderful when you can be in that place that's what God has done through us as a church through you And so I'm saying to you this morning, don't be discouraged, child of God. We must go after everything God wants us to have. We must reach because there's many more people that need to come into the kingdom. You should be inviting people every week to church. There are people that will, do you know, some people will come only if you invite them. And then they say, listen, you come. I got a seat for you. Come and sit next to me on Sunday. And they'll come. But we need to keep preaching the gospel and reaching people. But let's not just think of ourselves. When I preach about all these things, it's because we want to have so that we can be a blessing. Firstly, it brings peace. Do you know it's so challenging for me to focus on preaching and focus on on others when my needs are not met, when my bills are not paid, when I have so many things I must attend to and the church responsibilities and plus the, 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 my personal. When you, when you don't have enough for those needs to be met, it, it's a distraction. Because now you, you're focusing on yourself instead of focusing. So you have to purpose and say, no, 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 God's my source. I'm focusing on you, Jesus. And you keep preaching the word. But that's how it is with you. But when your needs are met and you have more than enough, then it's easy to focus on others. And say, hey, you know what? Let me see how my brother Clive is doing today. Let me see how uh, sister Sarah is doing today. Let me, because now you're feeling good. You're feeling happy. You're feeling strong. And, 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 And we all go through times of testing and all go through times of trouble. But even in the middle of that, we must keep reaching out. In the week, my wife said to you, you must vote so and so and check up on them. And you must vote so and so and check up on them. I said, who's checking up on me? I'm always checking up. Who's checking up on me a bit? I'm also need encouragement. Amen. <laughs> Amen. I also want to be appreciated a bit. But that's just the call. That's just what we gave our lives to. We gave, but it's wonderful when you focus on other people. And you are a blessing. Amen. So come and stand, child of God. Let's pray for you this morning. I'm believing God with you. Amen. That you're going to enter into your land of more than enough. God is bringing you into a good land. A land of brooks of water, of fountains and springs that flow out of valleys and hills. A land of of pomegranates, olive oil and honey. A land of more than enough. That's God's will for you. God's bringing you into that. And we're going to agree with you.